uh, in some uh, real life, let's say structures, mostly uh, structures from the aircraft design. And uh, since this winter school should have happened last summer, uh, when I was preparing this, this lecture, my first idea was because I was expecting to be in the lab with the students and then we can use computers for simulation. My first uh, idea was to prepare a few examples uh, to work on with them, I mean with students, and uh, to teach them and to show them how to use some of these modern, modern numerical methods for computer simulations of the crack of growth. But unfortunately, due to, due to this coronavirus, uh, I had to change my, my plans. So this presentation uh, will be mostly about uh, uh, the use of numerical methods in a, in a simulation. And I prepared several case studies to illustrate uh, this use and how these numerical simulations uh, developed and changed over the years in the last, let's say, two, two, two decades. So um, when we talk about fatigue and fatigue growth, we usually think about material fatigue. And uh, we are aware that fractures due to dynamic loads uh, have been occurring in a lot varying structures since ancient time. But uh, the study of fracture has intensified when metals became the dominant materials in the, in the structures. So let's say the end of the 19th century and beginning of the, of the 20th century. And during the 20th century, we learned that Repeated load uh, causes a process that today we call material fatigue. So definition of fatigue can be seen on the on on this slide, but in, in brief, it's the weakening of material caused by cyclic loading. And as a result of this cyclic loading, we have uh, localized structural damage and the growth of cracks. So um, here we can see on this next slide one example of material fatigue. This is Jack Hammer component. And the main problem with, with fatigue is that, uh, you know, these components, they show no yielding before, before fracture. So uh, this is very, very big problem because usually some structure might look, uh, when you look at, at, at the structure from the side, it might look like uh, everything is okay and that nothing, nothing bad can happen. Uh, but uh, suddenly a, a fracture occurs and you can see here in this, in this uh, image that crack initiation site and be, uh, between crack initiation site and fracture zone, crack grows. And this is definitely not uh, instantaneous fracture. And uh, then we re realized that there is some kind of mechanism behind, behind this and uh, engineers and scientists started to study this behavior and, and this phenomenon. And uh, as a result of uh, uh, this study, we developed uh, two, two approaches in the design of structures. So approach number one is called safe life. Uh, in safe life approach, we do not allow any crack. So uh, this is, let's say, a traditional or conventional approach used like 100 years ago. So every structure was designed uh, to uh, carry the load without any uh, occurrence of a crack or fracture. Even today, we use this approach. Uh, for example, we're talking about aircraft structure, a landing gear or wing fuselage attachment and engine mounts, for example. For them, we use this so-called safe life approach or safe life philosophy of design. So we don't want these structures to have any crack. And uh, why? Because uh, these uh, elements of the, of the aircraft, or aircraft structure, they are not redundant. If we lose landing gear, then the consequences would be, would be uh, catastrophic. But on the other hand, when we have redundancy in the structure, uh, for example, in the case of fuselage or, or the wing, uh, if failure occurs, if crack, I mean, starts to grow from one, let's say, riveted hole, and if we can see that crack during the maintenance or during some ins inspections, we can tolerate the length uh, of the of the of the crack. I mean, uh, we can allow crack growth, but uh, it must be controlled. It must be observed, and when crack reaches critical length, that part must be replaced. Uh, so, of course, here we have some some I mean risk uh, because in some cases the cracks can grow. I mean, very fast. I mean, faster than we expected. 
and then things like this might happen. So this is very famous case of the uh, so-called uh, Aloha flight incident, uh, Boeing 737. I think this was the mid 80s. Uh, during the flight, uh, as you can see, upper part of the fuselage, I mean, uh, uh, failed. And as you can see, this aircraft, Boeing 737, landed without upper part of the fuselage. Uh, analysis of, of this incident uh, showed that uh, cracks start to grow from riveted holes. They joined, and then during the flight, they made, they made one huge crack, and then that crack ripped off complete plane's cabin uh, area, and you can see what happened. Some people lost their lives, and it's also a good example why during, during the flight we must use seat, seat belts. Uh, uh, this is, let's say, example of uh, bad fail safe design because crack here on the fuselage, as I said, is allowed. And uh, nowadays, to prevent this, these, these accidents, to, to prevent these catastrophic uh, consequences, we use numerical methods and numerical simulations of the crack growth. So on this next slide, uh, you can see in this short video, you can see the simulation of the crack growth from 11 holes. So these 11 holes are, um, let's say, holes for, for riveted joints, uh, typical, typical holes on the, on, the, on the skin of the fuselage, for example. And we can see here that we have, uh, this uh, simulation shows the growth of 22 cracks at the same time. So 11 holes, each hole two cracks. And we can see that these cracks in the middle, I mean, around fifth and, and seventh, uh, uh, fifth and sixth hole, are growing faster than, let's say, cracks on the first and um, 11th hole. Uh, why? Okay, so there is a theory be behind this, and uh, we know this from practice. Okay, but again, this, uh, this presentation lecture is not, not about theoretical approach. Uh, this is about numerical approach. So I just want to show you that something like this now it's possible to, to simulate and to evaluate the fatigue life of structure like this, when you have 22 simultaneous. So something like this actually happened on this Boeing 737 uh, some, some uh, 30, years, 30 years ago. Uh, now, using this kind of simulation and using some theoretical approach uh, based on evaluation of the fatigue life using, let's say, Paris law or, or, or Walker equation or Nazgul equation, we can estimate the life of the damaged structure when uh, there is crack on the on the screen and uh, also we can here uh, estimate the critical length of the of the crack i mean when when that crack will become unstable and then start to grow very fast so things like this like this uh, weren't possible 30 years ago but nowadays okay we can we can do this and this presentation is mostly about the use of of these methods to get simulation like this uh, okay, next slide um, is uh, about different phases of the fatigue life. Okay, I believe that all students and all participants to, to this lecture already know this. This is just a short reminder that uh, uh, nowadays we can uh, simulate using numerical methods uh, two, uh, two crack, uh, or let's say two phases of, of crack grow, micro crack growth and macro crack growth. So in this micro crack grow, the most important uh, factor for uh, analysis of the of the of the crack is stress concentration factor KT. While for macro crack growth, when crack becomes visible and start to grow until final failure, we use we use uh, stress intensity factor as the most important parameter of mechanics of fracture or fracture mechanics to estimate the life of a damage damage structure. So stress intensity factors, you can see here is a measure of the singular stress term occurring near the crack tip. Okay, so uh, all the simulations that you're going to see in this presentation today are about this uh, crack growth period when crack is visible and then until final fracture. And so as we can see from this slide, the most important factor to be evaluated is stress intensity factor K. Okay, so this is also well well known image of the of the Paris of the Paris law. Okay, so uh, during the 50s, 60s of the 20th century, uh, uh, engineers and, and and researchers they discovered that when crack starts to grow, I'm talking about uh, macro level, uh, 
uh, there are there are three, let's say, uh, stages or or phases in a, in a crack growth, and then we can talk about three regions. Uh, region number one in this image is where uh, uh, stress intensity factor change is less than threshold. Uh, so uh, this means that crack will not grow until until stress intensity factor uh, reaches some value which we call threshold value. And that's this first phase, uh, phase when or, or stage where crack is still not visible. Maybe there is some inside crack, I mean, which is on a, on a, on a micro level, uh, uh, vis uh, not visible, but uh, uh, exists. But when it becomes visible, then have this uh, region two, which is usually called Paris region. And we can see in this log log uh, diagram that uh, during this during this stage, during this phase, crack has more or less stable stable growth. We can see that slope of this curve is uh, almost constant. But there is a point where this uh, uh, growth uh, becomes unstable, and then we can uh, observe fast crack growth. And that's region number three, this red red region. So uh, when I was talking about these cracks on the on the skin of the fuselage or wing, uh, and I said critical crack length, so we cannot allow in a fail-safe design crack lengths uh, uh, greater than critical length of the crack. So using these either experiments or numerical simulations, we must uh, evaluate, we must determine the critical crack length. And then to prevent uh, catastrophic damage or catastrophic failure, we need to uh, do, I mean, do something, replace that, that component or uh, do some uh, uh, maintenance to uh, uh, stop that crack from. Uh, in my experience, because uh, I spend a lot of time uh, in, uh, in hangars with, with aircraft, and uh, so uh, uh, very often one of the, of the tricks these technicians uh, or mechanics, uh, what, what they do, they simply drill a hole at the, crick, uh, at the tip of the crack to stop that crack. If you see that that crack is very close to, to reach critical length, but uh, that aircraft must fly. So they drill a hole at the crack tip and then they say, okay, now you can go, but uh, next up uh, some, some preventive actions must, must, be, must be taken. Okay. Uh, so for this region number two, Paris proposed this equation that we, that we can see here on the on the top of the slide. But in the meantime, uh, other researchers they proposed uh, uh, other equations. For example, Forman equation and Walker equation, they take into account stress ratio. We can see stress ratio is the ratio of the of the minimum over maximum maximum stress, and uh, uh, we can see here that the Paris equation does not account for the stress ratio R, but Walker and Foreman equation, uh, they take into account not only, not only uh, stress ratio, but also some uh, material constants like gamma, which you can see in Walker equation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, researchers are trying to, to make these uh, equations to be very close to experimental data and uh, to find the line of best fit through the data and then to uh, take into account all possible influences on a, on a crack growth. Uh, the most comprehensive formula or equation for region two was proposed by by NASA, and it's called Nazgul equation. So Nazgul equation, uh, 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 working together on one project, NASA researchers and researchers from I think Southern uh, Research Institute from uh, I think California. I'm not sure. But they worked together and they uh, carried out thousands of experiments with different metals in order to uh, evaluate uh, the, uh, this region number two to find the appropriate formula for this region number two. And then they came with this uh, Nazgul equation. You can see that Nazgul equation uh, um, uh, contains many, many factors, many constants that must be evaluated experimentally plus uh, you can see here coefficients C, P, Q, and N must be obtained empirically, so uh, or in, are empirically obtained. Uh, so uh, it's not easy to 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 use this Nazgul equation. It's not easy to integrate Nazgul equation. On the left hand side, you can see dA by dN, so that's the the uh, crack growth per cycle 
and in other in, in order to 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 find the relation between uh, crack length and number of cycles which we need for uh, evaluation of fatigue life uh, uh, we need to integrate NASA equation uh, good news is that uh, researchers from NASA they uh, put all these uh, coefficients in one software which is called NAS Grow software and I'll talk about that later I mean in a, in a couple of minutes so my point is that uh, these equations we don't have one equation for for evaluation of the of the region two uh, but uh, Paris equation is the oldest but still widely used for for evaluation of fatigue of fatigue life and usually when we say fatigue life we, we mean number of cycles to to final failure okay uh, for evaluation of stress intensity factor we use uh, specimens like this CT specimen or con uh, compact tension specimen is shown on on the left hand side of this image and on the right hand side we, you can uh, we can also see the comparison of uh, CT specimen and central crack tension specimen which is in fact one rectangular plate with a crack in the middle uh, the problem with with this with these test specimens is that um, okay well is that we get from these experiments uh, uh, we can then compare these values with analytical solutions for K and numerical solutions for K. And you will see. Yes, please. Okay, I can hear some voices. Some like some kids talking. Okay. Uh, but you will see later in this presentation. Uh, okay, I use these specimens for evaluation of uh, of uh, numerical methods. I mean uh, accuracy of numerical methods used for this. Uh, another important thing: this whole uh, I mean winter school is about additive manufacturing. And if you're asking your, yourself, okay, well, why this guy is talking about numerical methods and he's not talking about additive? Uh, manufacturing so uh, as a part of a uh, serum team uh, my job will be uh, to make uh, numerical simulations of the of the of the uh, specimens made by additive manufacturing so uh, this is a review of the methods that we used for metals i mean um, typical metal alloys plus for composites and then the same methods and the same approach will be used for evaluation of fatigue life of additively manufactured components uh, so uh, we need specimens and uh, for metals specimens and the measures of the specimens are defined by standards and hopefully very soon we'll have similar standards for for additive manufacturing okay so uh, for stress intensity factor calculation we have three approaches approach number one is uh, is uh, analytical approach approach number two is numerical and number three, experimental techniques. So uh, the best is to combine all, all and then to compare results. Uh, so uh, stress intensity factor calculation, you can see here on this slide, uh, three modes of, of crack growth and then three, three factors, K1, K2, and K3. We can see that these uh, equations and formulae are not simple, not simple to, to use, not simple to solve. Uh, but good news is that for uh, many typical typical specimens, uh, you can find uh, in the books, in the handbooks, you can find solutions for analytical solutions for, let's say, the the most commonly used specimens. Uh, so here you can see a source that I use here is a T of Fat uh, book, uh, which is called Stress Intensity Factors, T Stresses and Weight Functions. So this guy from Germany. In 2008, he wrote a book about, of course, using some other references and, and, and other books. He wrote the books about all uh, analytically analytically solved solved uh, geometries with solutions for K1 and and in some cases for for K2. We can see maybe I skip this on 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 this slide. So mostly we work with K1 because K1 is for you can see here pure tension. When crack opens, when these two two legs of the of the specimen are under tension, I mean are exposed to to tension load, so the crack will open, and this is the let's say 95% of the cases, a crack will grow when some specimen or some structure is exposed to to tensile stress. But mod two and mod three are also possible in some in some cases, depending. I mean this depends on the external load. 
Uh, so my point is that analytical solutions are very complicated and it's not easy to get them. So mathematics behind this is, is really complex and takes a lot of time. Uh, you can see here uh, uh, in this slide here, I just put uh, the values, I mean, how to calculate the stress around this crack uh, in, the, in the middle of the plate uh, exposed to uh, tension and how to evaluate uh, the stress at the points around that crack, okay? And you can see here formula for sigma two, two. So this, this is normal stress in a, in, a, in a direction two. And you can also see U1 is a displacement. So you can see these formulas are not easy to, uh, to, to use in, in reality. And this reminds me of, uh, we're all familiar with natural frequencies of the body. So we know that uh, natural frequency can be, can be found for bodies of a simple geometry like beams or like frames. But if you have a complex structure, I mean, a structure with complex geometry, which is a wing or a fuselage or a engine cover, so you cannot use analytical approach. In that case, only numerical approach can give you the solution. So if I want to find uh, um, natural frequencies and modes of the, of the, of the uh, vibrations for, for the wing of the light aircraft, I must use numerical methods. Uh, I mean, I can approximate the wing by plate uh, and then f find some approximate solution, but the numerical solution will, will, I mean, be faster and probably more, more accurate than, but if you talk about basic beams, and ba basic geometry, analytic solution is more accurate than numerical solution. So something similar we have here. Uh, so for simple beams and simple, plates with the holes or uh, with the cracked holes or when you have plate with the edge at one uh, at, uh, at the edge crack we have analytical solutions but for complex geometry like wing or wing attachment or uh, or uh, the fuselage or frames we don't have analytical solutions and it's impossible to get analytical solution so this is why we need numerical methods and on this slide you can see software that nowadays we use for numerical simulations of the of the of the crack growth and basically we have two uh i mean more most widely used uh numerical methods boundary element method and finite element method so you can also see here extended finite element method which which uh, uh became available uh approximately 10 years ago and uh, I met and started to work with the uh, extended finite element method approach uh, approximately approximately 10, 10 years ago when uh, that uh, method uh, was uh, uh, available in Abacus, in Abacus software. But all these software are still, still available. Uh, most of them are commercial, but some of them can be downloaded and installed on your PCs for free. Let's say a code stair is completely, completely free, but code stair uh, is based on Linux operating system. So you have to, there are some applications for Windows, but it works much better in, in a Linux environment. Uh, also France uh, 2D, this France 2D or Frank 2D, I don't know how to read this acronym, but it stands for Fracture Analysis Code. Uh, Fracture Analysis Code 2D and Fracture Analysis Code 3D. Both Frank 2D and Frank 3D uh, were free like 15 years ago. And nowadays Frank 3D is a commercial software and Frank 2D is still free and available later to receive. I'll, uh, I'll tell you where you can download this software. NASGRO, NASGRO is software developed by uh, NASA. It was free until 2004, but now it's, it's commercial. So if you want to use NASGRO, you have to, you have to pay. So, um, I decided to start first with NASGRO software because this is the first software I used for evaluation of the, of the fatigue life of some cracked components. So, uh, NASGRO uh, V4, I said it was free. And unfortunately, nowadays, NASGRO, uh, the newest version is NASGRO 9. It's uh, commercial, so you need to pay if you want to get it. And you can see on, the, on this slide, you can see the website where you can, you can uh, I mean, uh, find the NASGO V4 for software. So in NASGO uh, software, it's based on this NASGO equation. 
And uh, there is a database here with typical typical specimens. And you can see here on this slide, you can see this is a infinite plate with a hole in the middle. And there is one crack here, a length C initial crack around this hole. And you can see here that first you need to select that, that from the database. So uh, NASGO works with predefined, predefined specimens, but also you can define your own model and then uh, uh, carry out calculations uh, using bounded element method. Uh, uh, but okay, in this case, this is just, just to show you. So you would select, you select the specimen from the from database, you define here the thickness, the diameter hole, uh, you choose units, you can, you can choose between uh, standard units and uh, American units. Next step is to choose material from a database. Uh, there are more than, I think, 200 materials in this database. Again, unfortunately, this database is not now uh, available for, for free download. And then from this database, you can see here I selected, let's say, Aluminum 2000 series 2024 t3 this is typical aluminum alloy used in aircraft design and then uh, we saw on, on one of these previous slides these coefficients of nasgo equation so there all these coefficients are here available so you simply select the material from a from a from a database and then of course you define the load okay on, on previous slide okay you can see that here you can apply either moment or uh, or uh, or uh, uh, normal stress and then uh, the output of the NASGRO software was this a plot of the uh, change of stress intensity factors with the crack length or uh, number of cycles that will grow crack to, to uh, critical length. And you can see here in this case for this material and uh, under this load uh, uh, crack, I mean, we'll, we'll have this, uh, you know, we can, we can see now here clearly see uh, that there is a here a region with a with a stable growth and then very fast growth here, and approximately this is something about thirty five thousand uh, thirty seven thousand cycles until until complete complete failure. So uh, this is how we evaluated. Uh, uh, I could I could take one plate with one hole from uh, from a NASGRO database and then evaluate the the how fast that crack under a given load will will grow. And then evaluate maybe possibility that uh, that crack uh, uh, starting from a riveted, riveted hole will cause some damage on a wing or on a fuselage. But uh, that was, uh, I mean, not not good approximation to, to to reality. Because in reality, we we have not one, we have eleven or twenty or, or fifty uh, holes in a row. And you saw on 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 that slide when I simulated the length of twenty two cracks simultaneously. So that result was uh, only, let's say, rough approximation to, to reality. But in approximately uh, year 2001, 2002, uh, uh, Cornell University from, from New York, they, they uh, created this France or Frank 2D software available for, for free download where you could make uh, and it's still uh, free, and you can still go there uh, and download today or tomorrow and 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 play with this software. So uh, you you could def define a two D model with a triangular or uh, or quadratic elements, finite elements, and then here uh, define where is the position of the of the crack tip, and then to simulate the growth of the crack uh, under a given load using a, a manual definition of mesh so what does this mean to to define uh, manually so after each step of the crack growth you had to uh, make new new mesh around around the crack tip or to allow software to to do that so you had the options for automatic growth and for uh, manual growth where after each step of crack growth you you define new mesh around around the crack tip so that was very painful and still painful. So I, I uh, encourage you to, to try to, to uh, I mean, uh, to download and try, try this software to, and then you will understand what I'm talking about here. But uh, I use that software to, to, to compare results with NASGRO solution. And you can see here uh, for uh, two types of elements, Q8, so quadrilateral elements and T6 triangular elements, 
and NASGO V4 solution based on boundary element method. So we can see that difference in a, a calculated K1 values was not so big. So difference was something about three to five percent between NASGO and 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 franked uh, to the to the software. Uh, what was then the next step in relation of fatigue life? So you can see on this slide uh, the shape of the of this uh, let's say k k1 values change so next step was to find the polynomial equation of this change using the fifth or sixth uh, uh, degree of uh, polynomial and then to integrate the nasgo equation to get the you know correct length uh, as a function of number of of cycles and okay maybe it's not visible here but i'll try to yeah to zoom in to see for example uh here uh, to reach uh, correct length of 36 36 uh, millimeters estimated number of cycles was 25000 cycles so this value was was comparable was comparable to that value that we got from nasgro nasgro software uh, which means that you know this uh, uh, integration of nasgro e equation was successful so uh, either using uh, this front studio based on finite element method or using NASB software, we, I mean, managed to get uh, approximately the same result in the same relation of fatigue life. Again, number of cycles that will grow the, the crack to critical length. Then a uh, couple of years later, Frank 3D uh, appeared on the same website of the Cornell University, Cornell University, but nowadays I tell it's, it's, it's commercial software. The difference between 2D and 3D logically was that here you could uh, you could simulate 3D crack growth. Uh, what's the main difference? Okay, first of all, uh, yeah, complexity of the of the calculations and uh, number of nodes and number of here degrees of freedom was was much much greater. Uh, uh, that's that's one side of the story. Other side of the story, when using uh, 3D uh, when using 2D models in Nasgro or in Frank 2D. Uh, you are calculating the value at the crack tip. So there is only one node at which we calculate or software calculates um, value of stress intensity factor. But here we're talking about uh, uh, front, crack front. And you can see here these blue and green dots are representing uh, this uh, new crack front. So now we have more than one node, more than one point because this crack can grow in 3D. And for each crack on uh, on uh, for each node on the crack, a software must find the value of K1 and K2 because in 3D we have also if I mean this depends of course on on external load, but crack can grow uh, in a in a space, not in one plane. And you can see here the this 3D uh, Frank 3D uh, allowed user to to estimate the new position of the crack front, the new nodes. Uh, I mean, position of, of nodes of new crack, crack front. You can also see here in, in these images that uh, it was important also to make the uh, mesh of the crack. So uh, here, this crack uh, has uh, its, its, its penny shaped crack and you couldn't make your own shape of the crack. You could use only predefined shapes from the, from the, from the base, from database here of, of Frank 3D. And then uh, uh, you also had two solutions, either to manually generate, I mean, uh, 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 nodes around around the, the crack front, or uh, again to use automatic method. You can see here uh, this was initial crack here on the left on the left image, and then on the right image you can see final crack before before failure before before this part uh, broke. And uh, you can see that during during the calculation, number of nodes increases which means with every new uh, step of crack growth, and this crack, of course, uh, grow not only on, uh, along the surface, it also grow inside, I mean, uh, through the depth of, of this body. So every new calculation was longer and longer, and it was very uh, computationally expensive because number of, of nodes increased with every new step of, of propagation. And you had um, an opportunity to create your own crack front around, around uh, uh, I mean, uh, new uh, mesh around the crack front or uh, to allow software to do that. Uh, uh, result was this, you could get K1 and K2 along the 
along the crack front at each node on the crack front and then so this is what you can see here uh, uh, a and b are uh, let's say uh, uh, edge edge points of the, of the crack and then you can see here on on this image for every node between point a and b software calculates k1 and k2 and then if you use automatic uh, crack growth then uh, software calculates um, you know uh, so-called uh, equivalent equivalent stress intensity factor and here I put some of the formulae because different software uh, you uh, use uh, different different uh, formula for equivalent uh, stress intensity factor so here are some of the most commonly used and also formula for kink, kink angle so kink angle formula uh, helps uh, you know uh, in uh, calculation of the path of the crack growth so in uh, when we have uh, you know 2d that crack will grow in that plane only but in 3d it can grow in any direction depending on uh, on external force so uh just try to imagine uh that somebody gives you the problem like this uh, uh, gives you you know um, uh, some structure like like on this image and then ask you to to manually calculate the uh, you know direction of the crack growth and to manually calculate uh, i mean uh, stress intensity factor so uh, my point is without numerical methods and uh, numerical uh, i mean approach here uh, we would be blind in terms of uh, you know crack direction number of of cycles to to failure and so on of course we still have some difficulties and also later in in this presentation you will see uh, some of the difficulties and you will see that numerical uh, methods and medical simulation is not I mean without some some uh, let's say uh, drawbacks and we need to uh, be ready and to uh, uh, I mean prevent the errors or or uh, or mistakes in uh, evaluation based on uh, on bad results from numerical simulations but okay we'll see this in a in a couple of minutes okay now ANSYS smart technology okay uh, uh ANSYS is my favorite software for finite element analysis and uh okay so here uh, uh the main problem with ANSYS was that they introduced fracture fracture mode or mode for analysis of the crack growth only i mean two years ago i think it was in 2018 or 2019 let's say beginning of 2019 when ANSYS introduced this so-called smart technology uh, for uh, uh, simulation of crack growth in a structure so this smart is an acronym for separating morphing adaptive and remeshing technology and uh, this te technology allows user to to calculate mode one two and three of stress intensity factors also uh, support static crack propagation and uh, fatigue crack propagation paris law is law used in a in a evaluation of fatigue life then we can create uh, you know arbitrary cracks we can use some predefined cracks like semi-elliptical then we can also uh, define pre-matched cracks and i prepare one example to show you to explain the difference between pre-matched cracks and semi-elliptical cracks let's say it's limited to isotropic linear elastic analysis uh, one of the main uh, let's say uh, disadvantages is uh, that uh, we can use and simulate the crack growth in assemblies but only MPC which stands for multiple uh, multi-point constraints uh, formulation can be used for contacts which means that we cannot we cannot simulate frictional contact or frictionless contact so that's a problem because if I cannot simulate frictional or frictionless uh, context, then especially frictional, then uh, probably a law distribution and stress distribution uh, will not uh, reflect the reality. But good news is a couple of days ago, a new version of, of ANSYS arrived, and um, I didn't have time to, to test that new version, but they say that now all, all contacts are possible that uh, we can simulate in frictional and uh, other other nonlinear types of the content but at the moment only mpc multi-point constraints can be used we can simulate multiple cracks in the in the model and we can for me maybe this is the most important thing i can import the loads from other software for example in analysis of uh, fatigue life of the wing 
uh, first uh, analysis that we do is a CFD analysis in fluent software. So we simulate the fluid flow around the wing. And then as a result of interaction between the, the fluid and the structure, we get pressure at nodes. Now I can import these pressures from fluent as an external load, and then I can simulate the crack growth on a, on a, on a let's say, skin of the wing between riveted holes, which means that I, now I can create a numerical simulation, a numerical analysis of the, let's say, um, uh, uh, a case which is very, very close to reality. So I have, uh, uh, I mean, pressures from, 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 uh, from CFD analysis. I can import them, apply them in nodes to my FE model, and then I can calculate. So a couple of my PhD students are now working on, on, on their PhD thesis using this interaction and, 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 and plus as a result of all these simulations, we can optimize the structure. And then uh, not only uh, you know, in the terms of uh, uh, choosing the best material, but uh, to redesign the structure and then uh, reduce the mass of the structure, but not reducing at the same load carrying capabilities of the structure. So just to explain here, I prepared here just as illustration. Uh, now on the screen, you can see the you can see a uh, model of CT specimen I, I made in Enances. And I want to explain what is pre predefined predefined crack. So uh, you can see here that my geometry was uh, defined in a way that crack is already here. You can see here when I when I zoom in, you can see here that a crack exists, right? So this crack uh, was defined in geometry in geometry. So uh, when I was working on 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 CAD model here, so uh, when you define crack like this. So I made this crack in a 3D, okay? So then you need to, do, to define what is the upper surface of the crack? What is the lower surface of the crack? So in other words, you need to define nodes manually. And I'll show you this. So here I made uh, so-called uh, uh, name selections here and define what is uh, uh, upper. And look, th these are, let's say here, front nodes. So these are nodes that I defined on a crack front. Okay, I'll try to to zoom in so you can see nodes, these uh, pink uh, points are, okay, maybe not easy to, to show because eh, maybe here, you can see here these pink nodes uh, at the crack tip. Then I need to define nodes on a upper surface and lower surface of the crack like this. This is one surface of the crack and the other surface of the crack is this. And also to define the nodes where my uh, specimen will be, uh, I mean, to define, to, to apply boundary conditions. So uh, if you are defining pre mesh crack, this means that you must make crack and then create nodes on that crack. So this is called pre mesh crack analysis. And uh, when you have model like this, of course, then you can apply here loads. I applied pressure on, on, on this hole and pressure on this hole. And then here I define nodal displacements. So boundary conditions on this side. And then I did calculation. I got the formation like this, as you can see at the end of the, of the, of the simulation, uh, then equivalent stress at the end of simulation, but also we can see and analyze how that stress is changing with the crack growth like this. So you can see that mouth of the, of the crack opens and then crack starts to grow. And we can see on the left-hand side how stress, equivalent stress is changing during the, during the simulation. And uh, yeah, now we'll see a complete simulation. Of course, I could propagate the crack to the final failure but I wanted to compare results of this specimen with analytical analytical solutions and other numerical solutions. So we'll see that very soon in a, in a presentation. But what is good about dance is here that uh, there is a fracture tool, which is called fracture tool, where you can where you can evaluate all these all these uh, you know uh, parameters of fracture mechanics. So stress intensity factors. Okay, we can see here when I zoom in. Uh, so these are the nodes that I previously wanted to show you, we can see that along this crack front that uh, stress intensity factors are calculated at each crack node. 
and then that the value here be, uh, varies between 270 megapascal square root of millimeter and the maximum value is 297.11 and the maximum values are these nodes in the middle of the of the crack front uh so uh also it is possible here so i here just uh, i'm showing you uh, k1 but i can also here insert k3 let's say and evaluate all these uh, you can see k1 k2 k3 and evaluate all these but okay this is uh, this is uh, here we have plain stress and then k2 and k3 these values should be very small very close to zero but you know in numerical methods we don't have zero i mean it's always something like 0, 0. 0.000 something also j integral but only for the elastic elastic uh, uh, properties of material then t stress uh, then equivalent sifts range so we can also here calculate equivalent uh, sifts but uh, sifs but uh, that equivalent here should be very close to k1 because this is here we have you know uh, stress which is only in 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 one plane we don't have, i mean here we have a this is compact tension specimen so this is only under under tension and also using Paris law we can make chart like this where we can evaluate the number of cycles and here crack crack extension so crack will extend by almost seven millimeters in approximately twenty five thousand cycles here for Paris coefficients that I defined before before I started this this simulation so uh, uh, as I said before, my, my idea was to work with students on these simulations and to make together, because it's really not complicated, to make together uh, uh, models like this and, and, and carry out some simulations. But okay, I hope that this, uh, you know, coronavirus situation will, will, will finish soon and then we can meet and work together on, on these things. Okay, so uh, this is predefined or pre-meshed crack. But in ANSYS, we can also use this uh, predefined crack. So this is a cylinder. Uh, one part of the cylinder is, 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 is fixed, so bottom is fixed, and upper part is under tension again. And you can see here there is no crack. There is no geometrical crack on this, on this cylinder. But I can uh, here introduce crack using uh, here ANSYS library of cracks. And in fact, ANSYS supports at the moment only semi elliptical crack but i can uh, uh, draw and make any shape and it's called arbitrary crack and then i i can introduce arbitrary crack a uh, crack so you can see here this semi elliptical crack uh, will be introduced here and uh, uh, on the left hand side here i can define the radius of the of the major and, and minor so this crack is uh, uh, could be elliptical or or circular I can define the largest contour radius. I can define how many layers I want to use in a, in a calculations and so on. And then when we define mesh, we get something like this. You can see this is very similar to what you saw in, um, in this Frank 3D software. And then after applying the load and you know, conducting the carrying out simulation, we, we get something uh, like this. And we can see here how uh, this uh, crack opens and you can see how a uh, uh, number of uh, elements around crack three, uh, uh, front is changing with, with simulation uh, with, 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 with growth because ANSYS will automatically create uh, and refine the mesh around, around these uh, nodes on the crack front in order to, to get better solution for stress intensity factors. And of course, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, model cylinder with a crack in the middle, there is analytical solution, and then we can compare compare here stress intensity factors obtained with analytical solution, and we can see here uh, how it looks like this distribution of stress intensity factors, and we can see it varies between three four three and three seven eight, but also there is analytical solution for this. And in a, sim in a, in a simulation, uh, we are going to, in a presentation, we are going to compare, I'm going to compare uh, solutions obtained by analytical method and by ANSYS and extended finite element method. So let's go back to presentation. So this is ANSYS Smart Technology. I just wanted to, to show you some possibilities of, of this technology, which is available. Uh, students can go to ANSYS website. There is a free student version which you can download. 
and then you will get uh, one year uh, a license uh, for free. Uh, the only limitation, so you will get the full software with all capabilities. The only limitation is that the maximum number of nodes uh, should be 32,000 nodes. Uh, you cannot use mo more nodes. Okay, here in this simulation, I used, of course, more nodes. Here I used uh, 134,000 nodes. Uh, but I think in this simulation with the cylinder, I used less nodes. And as I said, the problem is uh, when, when, when crack grows, eh, here number of nodes, eh, 32,000 nodes. 32,000 nodes. I think this is the, the, the exercise I, I, I did with my students. So we uh, try to get a uh, you know, solution with this limited number, number of, of nodes. So 32,000 nodes, so simulation like this, you can, you, can, you can carry out. Okay, let's go back to uh, presentation. So go to ANSYS website and download this. Uh, extend the final element method uh, is, as it says, extended finite element. And uh, uh, this method uh, appeared, let's say, 10 years ago, approximately, let's say, 2009, 2010. And a year later, uh, it was introduced in Abacus, Abacus software. The main advantage of extended finite element method is that we can uh, uh, model uh, structure without the need and we can model uh, crack growth without the need for a remesh after ever uh, every step of crack growth uh, i told you that the main problem with the finite element is after remeshing uh, uh, with every new step of the crack growth the number of nodes increases and then uh, uh, calculation becomes more and more expensive i mean comput computationally expensive uh, in the case of the finite element method uh, we use one mesh through the whole calculation, uh, which helps us to, to reduce the number of nodes and uh, reduce time to solution. Of course, uh, extended finite method has its own drawbacks. It's not ideal, but let's say it is step forward in uh, analysis of the crack growth using numerical, numerical methods. Okay, let's see here. I prepare a few simulations. Uh, and okay, this is something I did. Uh, 10 years ago, it was 2011, 2012, 2011. So uh, when Abacus introduced XFAM, I used the Abacus to verify, I call this uh, verification of extended finite element method. And I used again, as you can see a model that I previously made 10 years before, not 10, but let's say it's six or seven years before that, that I made with Nasgro and later with, 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 with France 2D. So the same, but 3D model in this case. Don't forget that uh, Frank 2D and Asgard, they use 2D models. So this is 3D model in Abacus. I play with different meshes, hexahedral and tetrahedral, because I wanted to analyze the influence of the, of the type of the, of the mesh and number of nodes to, to solution. And you can see here, uh, I put these images to show you that mesh is not changing with crack growth. So look, this is initial crack. This is uh, opening the mouth of the crack. Then you can see here, uh, after nine steps of, of growth and after 17 step, you can see that the mesh is not changing. So crack grows through the mesh, which stays the same all the time. And I mean, number of nodes is not changing. So every new calculation, you have the same number of, of nodes when talking about uh, calculating the stress distribution around, around the crack. But uh, 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 if the crack uh, moves, in space, the number of nodes on the crack front will increase, and then that will increase the computational time. But in a case like this, when crack grows horizontally, I mean moves horizontally, and then the crack front is uh, always the same, but it moves, then for every step of calculation, it takes the same time. So you don't need to, to wait uh, a lot. And then you can evaluate K values along the crack front. So I put this image here just to compare with that image that we saw with Frank, Frank 3D. So very similar image. So for each crack front, I can, I can evaluate the value of, uh, I mean, node at, at the crack front, I can evaluate the value of K1. Then comparison, uh, K1 and K equivalent. So K equivalent is from 3D. Let's not forget that when we are analyzing a growth in 3D, then we use combination of K1 and K2. 
if again it's a pure tension then in that case k2 is negligible and then k1 is equal to k equivalent so in most cases k1 and k equivalent are very very similar almost the same but in some cases when we have uh, you know uh, by axial load, for example, in that case, we'll have different values of K1 and K equivalent. Okay, we can see here that, that Abacus produced or generated the same or almost the same values of, of K equivalent uh, compared to Nasgro and Frank 2D solution. And we can see that uh, from this uh, with hexahedral and tetrahedral elements, and we can see that uh, tetrahedral elements gave, let's say, more accurate results than, than, than hexahedral elements. And here in, on this image, we can, just a second, we can see the, how this crack grows through, through, through this specimen. And we can see stress change with the growth. So we can, we can define, I mean, produce result like this uh, animation of the of the of the crack road also this is uh, to see displacement field okay then the next was this ct specimen i showed you in uh, in ansys so you can see uh, that theoretical value theoretical value is uh, given here and there is uh, this corrective function y, which is a function of, of uh, crack length and thickness of the, of the specimen, which you must take into, in, into account. But OK, we, for this, for this uh, geometry, we have an analytical solution. And theoretical value for k1, of course, at the crack tip is 2 nines because this is 2D, 2D analytical solution. It's 297.18 uh, megapascal millimeter square root of millimeter. Okay, let's compare this to Abacus result, 292.50, so the difference is 1.57%. Nasgro result, difference is 5%. So as you can see, Nasgro tends to over, I mean, uh, underestimate the result, because again, 297 is, uh, is a theoretical value, Nasgro gives 282, Abacus 1.57%, and check the value for Check the value from, from ANSYS. Difference is 0.026%. So 297.11 compared to 297.18. So negligible difference between ANSYS value. Again, it's the value in the middle here. You can see that most nodes here have between 9, 294 and, and 297 here, but some nodes here on, on the edge, they have less less values but uh, the maximum value of 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 k1 uh, influences the life of the fatigue life of the structure so this is why i favorize i mean the use of 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 offenses uh eh, yeah this is what what we already what we saw before and you can see here change of the stress with crack growth and this is the the video produced in abacus I mean, not in Abacus. I exported results from the Abacus and then use another software to, to make this simulation, to be honest. Displacement field. Just a second. Yeah, uh, sorry. Displacement field. And then another two specimen. Specimens, okay, this is central crack tension specimen. And we can see here that we have two, uh, two crack fronts and they, they grow simultaneously in uh, in opposite directions then next is displacement field okay then non-standard specimen so if i mean i can confirm the results uh using standard specimens because for standard specimens we usually have analytical solutions then i can also define non-standard specimen which is the next step to real uh, i mean real structure real uh, uh i mean geometry that will be used in uh because let's not forget we do not use specimens in uh, in structures we use real components and real parts so idea here is to evaluate and to confirm that our method mesh approach is good that we can simulate with a very high accuracy um, uh, uh, 
crack growth and that results are comparable to, to analytical solutions or experimental results. And then we, with the, with the, with the confidence, we can then move to the final step and then design and evaluate the crack growth in a real structure. So this was the first part of presentation in, in, in which uh, I wanted to, to, to show you uh, how numerical methods can help us to evaluate uh, stress intensity factors and life, I mean, number of cycles to, uh, to final damage. And all these things are okay when we are playing with the specimens in a, in a lab and when we evaluate uh, fatigue life or evaluate stress intensity factors uh, for any purpose. But uh, th things, uh, they, they become very difficult when you have real life problems. So in my career, again, I'm an aeronautical engineer and uh, uh, my specialty is, uh, you know, simulations, medical simulations and life evaluation of aircraft uh, structures and components. And uh, here I prepared several case studies to, 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 to show you some of the experiments and uh, numerical simulations that me and my associates uh, uh, carried out in order to solve some problems in, um, in, um, in real life. So three case studies here I prepared. I wanted to show you more, but you know, time, time is short. And uh, I mean, I have uh, at, at least 20 different, different case studies that, that I can show you. Most of them are, uh, are from, 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 from practice, from my cooperation with some companies. Uh, but okay, let's see. Uh, first case study is uh, damage wing fuselage attachment. Okay, so uh, in analysis of aircraft structure, first step, if you, I mean, rely on a numerical simulation, the first step is to, to define a um, uh, finite element model of complete uh, aircraft structure. So you can see this, this is an aircraft that me and my team designed 10 years ago. Not only design, we, we made three prototypes and uh, one of these prototypes is still uh, uh, in, uh, in flight and we are now uh, we carry, out, carry out some, some uh, you know, a flight, flight test. So this is light aerobatic uh, aircraft and you can see here the structure of the, of the, of the fuselage and here there is an attachment of the fuselage uh, to, to wings. So this is where we attach wing to the, to the, to the fuselage. So first we did complete finite element analysis, numerical simulation of the loads that will act on the fuselage dur during the flight, then loads that will act on the wing during the flight to find the critical points, to find the points where the stress is, is, is maximum. So let's not forget during the flight, uh, aircraft is, is exposed to, um, uh, 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 air, I mean, and uh, uh, due to this interaction, fluid structure interaction, uh, wing vibrates all the time, all the time. So there are, there are small vibrations and, 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 and oscillations. And as a result of these vibrations and oscillations, so fatigue occurs. And uh, after we did this analysis of the wing and, 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 and fuselage separately using the results from CFD or using some analytical approach, uh, we uh, as a final step, we had to de uh, design uh, a wing fuselage attachment. You can see here in this image, geometry of wing fuselage attachment. This green part belongs to, to fuselage and uh, uh, a gray part is a part of the wing. But connection between wing and the fuselage uh, is established through this, uh, you know, pin lock connection here. And you can see that uh, final element analysis show that uh, critical area with high stress is here on, on this lock. Uh, stress calculated here was very high. Why? This is aerobatic um, aircraft. And during the flight, a maximum, a maximum load, I mean, inertial load is 6G, 6G. And when you multiply, uh, you know, all uh, these masses on the wing and mass of the aircraft, and plus if, when you include when you include uh, aerodynamic loads, so then this part of the attachment is under very high stress. And this should be a uh, safe life component. So here crack is not allowed because if this part breaks, if this part fails, you lose the aircraft. And uh, first step, so I told you this, this was a project 
uh, and I was a part of, of that project 10 years ago. And at that time, uh, we had only Frank 2D. And my first analysis of this component of this log was in, 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 in Frank uh, 2D. As you can see here, I simulated first the load to get the area of the highest stress, which is very close to the area of, uh, I mean, that 3D, 3D log. And then I simulated crack growth. As you can see, this was, of course, 2D, 2D crack, not so realistic because this lag is exposed not uh, only to is exposed to load in uh, in uh, in space so it's not a load in one plane so we have axial i mean transfers and 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 axial coupons so there are shear stresses there are also uh, normal stresses there so this first simulation was not so reliable but uh, good news was that this uh, lag i mean pin lag connection in this case should be should be safe life uh, um, design and uh, crack, uh, I mean, is not allowed here at all. But uh, two years later, uh, I had the opportunity to simulate this in uh, in Abacus using X fan, and then you can see here again I use initial penny shaped crack, and this is corner crack as you can see. And because I wanted to estimate uh, fatigue life, so what happens if crack appears on uh, on a lag? Again, I used hexahedral, tetrahedral mesh, and uh, uh, it may be, uh, when you look at this now, maybe it, it looks like, okay, so what's, what's the big deal here? But trust me, here, uh, sh shape of the, of the mesh, I mean, shape of the, of the element, then number of nodes here produced, then uh, how good you define the boundary conditions, then how you apply load here. Uh, so here uh, we must use bedding load. So it's not not the pressure. It's not uh, that you can at every load you have to apply the same the same force. So it's bedding load, which means some areas are under high stress. Uh, I'm talking here about the hole. Other areas plus friction. What about friction between the 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 pin and the lock? So many many things here must be taken in, into into consideration. And uh, then first I compared the results for tetrahedral and hexahedral match. And you can see here, uh, this was the proof. So I, I used, of course, uh, Paris law here uh, uh, with coefficients for, for, for that material. So uh, by the way, the complete aircraft is made of aluminum alloy. Uh, we use 2024 T3 aluminum, but this part is made of, of high strength steel. Uh, so uh, why high strength steel? Because this is the, just as I said, the I mean part of the aircraft maybe with the high stress. And uh, you can see here that number of cycles to, to failure is only about 750 cycles. So this is very, very low, which means um, this is why this must be uh, 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 safe life component, because if crack occurs, life of this component, fatigue life of this component is very short. On the other hand, uh, I also use the true crack to analyze the influence. What if true crack appears? And then uh, I made this simulation here in, in, in Abacus in XFAM, but recently, let's say a year and a half ago, I did the same, you can see here 2019, I did the same in ANSYS. I told you that ANSYS introduced this smart technology recently. And then I simulated the same crack growth using finite element method, this smart technology to get almost the same result. You will see here. So Abaco simulation uh, performed in 2012, and this is seven years later. I think uh, this was part of, of my student's master, master, master uh, thesis. So I encourage him to, to try to do this analysis and then to compare with, with, with my results. And then later we, we did the simulation. Uh, together. And then we can see comparison finite element method and extended finite uh, uh, element method. And then we can see here that uh, results in a, in, a, in a K1 values are, let's say, um, close, not, 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 not perfect match, but uh, I believe more in finite element, I mean, in, a, in a ANSYS technology. And number of cycles, not so different. As you can see, finite element method said 400 and extend uh, about 470. So 70 cycles more when X uh, FAM was, was used. And uh, one of our goals uh, 
uh, in the future will be to, to carry out the, the experiment. And do you know why? According to new regulations, uh, federal, I mean, aviation regulations, uh, 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 crack on the, this lug attachment will be allowed. Um, so there are many, many words and many voices uh, against, including my voice, against this, this uh, proposal. Uh, um, because, uh, but again, let's be honest, this is when N equals six, so 6G. So when load factor is 6G, so these are very high loads. So commercial, uh, commercial aircraft uh, uh, has a load factor two. So only 2G is allowed. In that case, this force is much less. But for aerobatic aircraft, I mean, uh, this is completely unacceptable. So, uh, in my opinion, this must be this must be safe life safe life component, and this simulation proves proves that. By the way, I also did the same uh, uh, analysis in Nasgro because Nasgro has also pin lag pin lag model and got approximately the same the same number of cycles. And we can see now that crack growth in this lag and here displacement. Okay, the second case study, uh, crack growth in the wing spar. Okay, now you can see here part of that light aircraft and you can see here uh, wing root uh, and the spar. So I want to here to, to show you because maybe you're not familiar with this, with these parts of the, of the aircraft. So uh, spar, is the main part of the wing. So it's like a beam, usually I beam. Okay, here I will, I will, I will zoom this. And you can see here this I beam here, that's, that's spar. And spar consists of caps. So it has two caps on the top and two caps on the bottom and spar web. And they together create I beam. So spar caps are riveted to spar web. And um, then they are also riveted to the, to the skin of the aircraft. So here you can see Part of the uh, this is position of the spar on the on the fuselage. So there is a spar on the fuselage and there is a spar on the on the wing. And you can see here this pin lug connection. You can see this attachment. So this is where wing is attached to the to the to the fuselage. And you we analyzed in the previous simulation. We analyzed what happens here on this on this lug. And now let's see what happens if crack appears on a spar. So here we have uh, uh, experiments, so all results uh, obtained in numerical simulation are supported here by experimental, experimental values. So you can see here the model of the SPAR made in, uh, in I believe, Katia software. And then this is uh, our experimental setup that we use for fatigue testing here to introduce here load, uh, which has this narrow uh, band, um, uh, band random shape, which means that we have oscillations up and down. And the maximum here uh, during the during the, 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 the experiment, the maximum measured displacement was uh, sorry was three millimeters. Okay, which is uh, for um, this part, let's say uh, too much. Uh, but we wanted to finish this experiment in some reasonable time. We didn't want to wait uh, for millions of of cycles for crack to appear and then to to observe crack growth in in the real structure. So this is why we apply relatively relatively high high load, and after approximately sixty thousand uh, uh, cycles, which was uh, I think that frequency here was something like two or three hertz. I can't remember. I mean, uh, this happened twelve years ago. We got this. Uh, uh, before I show you experimental experimental uh, images, uh, okay. First, we did uh, identification of the critical area. I mean, we try to identify where the crack will appear. Of course, crack, the most likely area where the, where the crack will appear is the uh, area where the highest tensile stress occurs. Uh, here we use these supporters, okay, uh, which you can see here. And also you can see them uh, here in, in this image. So these uh, supporters, uh, uh, we use them uh, to firmly, I mean, connect this to, to our uh, experimental uh, setup and here to apply load in uh, one plane. So to have a bending in, in one plane only to avoid some, uh, I mean, uh, torsion or, 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 or similar. But in reality, uh, here, when we connect the wing to, to the fuselage, we use pin lock connections. So it's not fixed. It's not fixed. So 
uh, but idea here was to you know get the crack and to analyze the the crack growth in some in some reasonable in reasonable time okay so first we did here this simulation to find a critical zone and then we used uh, sn methods for fatigue life estimation to estimate the time to crack occurrence and here using ansys uh, we estimated that uh, crack will appear after approximately eight uh, eight thousand cycles and that was the minimum value at at the node but here according to this according to this image in this area very close to support the crack will occur between let's say the 4000 and 13000 30000 uh, cycles of this narrow band uh, random loading and uh, because and we said okay we will get a crack after approximately maybe 10000 cycles that's okay and then we can analyze the crack growth and in reality this is what happened we got two cracks we expected one crack but we got two cracks first crack uh, appeared here you can see here on this uh, spar cap this is left spar cap uh, while on the on the on the right spar cap crack occurred here around this hole which is also i mean uh, logical and then uh, this first crack uh, 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 grew through this pair cap and then move horizontally like this along this edge you can see maybe on on this image then it moved like this and then move down and then stop here when it, it, the crack reached this hole the second crack started to, to grow uh, here in this direction and then also move down and then move along this edge and then move and finish here at this hole at this hole okay uh, just to be completely cl uh, clear so here um, yeah you can you cannot see it there but maybe in in next images uh, i think picture will be will be uh, clear okay so uh when i started this experiment again it was 10 10 10 year, years ago uh, the only tool i had was friends friends 2d and then for uh, you can see here broken broken spar so um so I simulated the crack growth in these uh, vertical walls of the of the of the left and right spar, and you can see that simulation. Of course, I applied the load, uh, trying to simulate and boundary conditions, trying to simulate reality, and then I got very similar path uh, crack path for this crack, as you can see when it's moving along this hole, and for this, for this, and look, uh, I simulated simultaneously. Uh, uh, crack growth because with this friends 2d uh, you can you can define the layers of material and then you can one layer was was one spar uh, the uh, layer number two was web uh, uh, uh sorry first layer was spar cap the second layer was spar web and the third was uh, the other spar cap and then because you can see here in this image you can see mesh on this layer but you can see here this line this is the, the crack on the third layer and here it's the in, uh, inverse picture so these are the crack pets observing experience so very similar to this and then using an asbury equation and the integration of an asbury equation i estimated the uh, the life i mean of these cracks along these these bar caps when when they uh, move and, but a year later i did the same calculation using 3d model in abacus and i used xfam so I inserted crack here in this area where where crack I mean first crack appeared in experiment, and at that time uh, we couldn't simulate simultaneously two 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 cracks. So I could simulate only one crack at at the time. So I, my decision was to simulate this this crack, and I inserted here this crack. Uh, you can see it's it's it's, it's penny shaped. Uh, mesh here in this area where the crack was expected to grow. I made finer mesh here, as you can see, and then started to, to simulate the crack row. You can see here the uh, uh, shape of the crack pad in a simulation and here in an in, in experiment on the same spar cap. Then, as you can see in my simulation, crack moved from horizontal part of the spar cap and then moved through vertical part, vertical wall of the spar cap until final failure so crack started here in this area then move like this and then uh, went down and then finish here at at the end of this 
of this park so simulation from 2011 and uh but in reality we didn't get this in reality uh, you can see here these white arrows in reality crack moved along this horizontal park horizontal wall and then when it reached this area with radius crack started to move in this direction and then ended here at this hole you can see here in this image so moving along this and then finish here on this on this hole you can see here three layers on this image so okay, cap web and the second spark cap so in frank 2d you can define three layers and you can simulate crack growth on these layers so this is what i did at that time so then we uh, were looking at, at, at this numerical model and numerical uh, 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 simulation and crack road, then we realized either my numerical model is not good because crack should move along these white lines or uh, something is bad with, uh, with uh, spare caps. So uh, I checked my model many times and then we decided to, to do something else, to try to, uh, because, uh, uh, we had, uh, I believe, uh, 11 or 12 spars uh, that we made for, uh, for uh, experiment. And uh, um, uh, in the first two spars, we stopped the experiment after, after two, two spars. We, we got more or less the same crack growth. Okay, results weren't the same. For first part, we got something about 60,000 cycles to crack. I mean, to final failure. For second, we got 80,000 cycles on, on, on a second spar. But more or less on both on both parts we we had the same crack path. So my numerical model indicated that either model is is is, is not uh, well defined or something must be done about about this part. So we made decision to improve the material of the spar. Uh, after I mean after uh, we cut these uh, because we we got these parts caps by bending. We use uh, rubber rubber pad forming. Rubber pad forming is a, is a manufacturing method uh, used in uh, aircraft design, and we use rubber pad forming uh, to create more than 80% components of the aircraft. But after uh, rubber pad forming, you must apply some thermal thermal uh, I mean uh, treatment and uh, for uh, stress removal, and usually we use stabilization. So we decided after we before we riveted this this spar cap to the to the spar web, we decided to stabilize that spark cap to re, uh, remove residual stresses and look what we got we got the, the new pet on this you can see on this on this uh, uh, spark cap which was very close to the pet obtained in numerical simulation which means that sometimes numerical simulations can help us uh, maybe to identify some weak uh, weaknesses or weak points on uh, on the manufacturer structure and after, after we stabilized all these parts, uh, we carried out experiments on, um, on other spars. Uh, and then we got that uh, in, I, I believe, uh, well, I believe, I'm sure we got uh, on nine spars, we got, we got a pet like this. And only on one spar, we got again, uh, some other, other, uh, you know, crack, crack pet. So this uh, means that uh, if numerical simulation is well, well defined, this can help us to uh, identify some, 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 uh, you know, bad design before we, before we build in that part on the, on the aircraft. And you can see here this 3D path of the, when a uh, crack is changing the plane in which it propagates. Uh, not to mention then after we calculated the equivalent stress factors for crack length and estimated fatigue life using Paris coefficients that you can see at the bottom of this slide, we got that crack will, I mean, uh, 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 break this bar after 50, you can see 50,000 something cycles in experiment, we got something about 58 cycles. So very close to uh average value in experiments again uh on some spars we got life around 100,000 cycles on some on some spars so this value a uh, number of, of of cycles but uh uh, uh, uh we didn't have any uh, case in which number of 
cyclus to failure of the spot was less than what I got in my numerical simulation. So numerical simulations uh, usually tends to underestimate the, the fatigue life, which is good because if numerical simulation underestimates fatigue life, this means that fatigue life in reality probably will be, will be, will be higher. And the last case study that I prepared for today, so this is comparison of results in FM, uh, finite element method in XFM uh, compared with, with, uh, uh, with experimental. And yeah, uh, just uh, uh, for you to, to remove maybe possibility that now you'll be af af afraid of, of, of uh, I mean, flying by, by, by aircraft. Okay, so these uh, lives are very low because we applied very high uh, displacements. And uh, because I told you that we wanted to get this, this crack as, as soon as possible and, and, and to analyze and to, to check the numerical simulation results. But in reality, we use this spectra you can see here for evaluation. And I use th this first is called the twist spectrum, which is used for uh, uh, T stands for uh, transport aircraft. And uh, Falstaff is used for, uh, for uh, fighters. And you can see that. Uh, for example, here in this case, for the spectrum, uh, three millimeters displacement occurs maybe uh, once in a, in, a, in, a, in a whole spectrum. So when I apply this spectrum of Falstaff and, uh, and twist, I got uh, life about one million cycles. So this means that uh, in reality, this, this, this uh, spar can, can carry more than one million cycles there uh, until, until damage of the of the of the spark of course this is estimated value not i cannot guarantee this but estimation is uh, as you can see uh, more optimistic than than experimental and finally in the last five minutes uh, i just want to uh, show you that uh, in previous case study uh, we saw that medical simulation can sometimes give very precise results but sometimes dif uh, differences could be could be big so uh, this uh, was a project uh, uh, sponsored by Airbus. When Airbus was uh, working on design of uh, a, uh, Airbus 380. And uh, uh, at that time they decided to replace uh, skin st stringer panels. These skin stringer panels, you can see here, uh, uh, they use them on almost every single part of, of the aircraft. I mean, uh, of. Uh, structure on the wings, on the fuselage, on the tails. And uh, in the past, they use this so-called differential structure. You can see there is a skin, then we have stringers, and we use these clips to connect stringers and skin to the frame of the, of the fuselage, and then uh, riveted joints here are, are used. So Airbus decided to, to change technology or design uh, of the, uh, and they move to integral structures in which they use laser beam welding to connect these stringers to, to panels. So why, why they use this? First of all, they, want to, they wanted to, to decrease the, the, the weight structure, number one. Number two, to reduce the number of potential stress concentrators. So every hole for rivet is, is possible stress concentrator and then uh, crack uh, growth can start from one of these holes but if you remove the holes you remove the possibilities for fatigue crack growth i mean it's still possible but but probability is less than before so differential versus integral structures and then they tested in the in their facilities in the gkss research center in hamburg germany they tested that i believe uh, uh, at, at least 20 or, or, or 30 so this was in 2003, uh, these new panels with the laser beam welded the string as you can see here on the, on the image. And uh, uh, I managed somehow to get these results from these uh, experiments. And then I uh, decided to, to make a model, uh, XFM model, and uh, to compare the stress results. I mean, uh, not stress results, uh, number of cycles uh, to the final damage to compare with experimental results. So uh, Germans, they um, uh, carry out Alexander. Uh, also. Yes. Uh, so we need to conclude because uh, we have uh, the next speaker. So please uh -huh. conclude. Okay, I'm sorry because I was thinking the next speaker starts at four at five o'clock. Okay. Okay. Conclusion. No, no. Sorry, then I, I, I misread. Take, the... take your time. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. No, no, no. Okay, I'm finishing in, in, in two minutes. Okay, so uh, uh, I made a model. 
here are inserted cracks in the in the middle just like they did in uh, in in hamburg in this in these uh, facilities and then i played with match so uh, uh, here in this area uh, of, the, of the of the crack occurrence, uh, first I used the uh, one millimeter mesh. So that that's the average average size of of the mesh used in simulation, and then got this crack growth and got this number of cycles uh, of approximately uh, two hundred and fifty thousand cycles. Uh, I used for Paris law. I used coefficients provided by by Germans. So they tested that material. It was aluminum alloy again. And then they got these coefficients. Then I used two millimeter mesh, the same model, but different mesh, and got more cycles. So look, here a me uh, mesh is coarser, but we can see that the number of cycles is higher. Okay, this makes sense, but you will see my point very soon. Then four millimeters mesh, more cycles. So and you can see here on this image how this was one of the of the most difficult simulations I, I ever made because it's uh, you know uh, we need to simulate the the crack growth uh, and then uh, at at one moment we have eight crack fronts and for each front we need to we need to evaluate uh, k1 and then estimate the number of cycles and then finally comparison of experimental and uh, numerical results so we can see here that difference is about 30 percent and uh this was another proof that extended finite element method uh tends to underestimate the, the uh, sorry to overestimate the values of k1 and underestimate the, the the number of of cycles so this is still ongoing let's say project and uh we are trying to to, to improve our results and get results closer to, to experimental values one of the of the differences uh, in our simulation, we didn't use a uh, well line. Uh, we just, uh, maybe it can be seen here. Look, so here we can see string, we can see skin, but there is no here well line. So it looks like it, it was made from, from one part, but this is, there is here a laser beam uh, welding. So to improve here, uh, uh, to insert, and we did that, wet lines, number one, and number two, to maybe play with the, different boundary conditions because here we apply boundary conditions only on these areas. You can see here red, red, red and, and, and blue. But in reality, they use here some supporters to intro, in, introduce load, which may be uh, somehow influenced. I mean, not maybe, that influenced uh, the life, how you introduce the load in reality and how you introduce lo uh, load in your numerical model. So to conclude, uh, all these numerical simulations that we carried out so far, uh, gives us uh, uh, confidence that we can do the same thing with, uh, you know, when we get get some elements uh, in additive manufacturing. So as soon as we get some results uh, from this Silam project, we are going to to publish this and maybe present on on next on next uh, winter or summer summer school. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so. If uh, you have some questions, you can put them in the chat, and we will see. Alexander, maybe we'll we'll, we'll oh, no. to them. Please uh, do that. I will, I will answer all, all your questions. Thank you. Uh, it's a. Can you stop sharing the? Yes. Okay. So uh, it's a.